Well, thank you very much uh, for the invite and well done to Nick and Michael to for organizing such a great day uh, with a great lineup and for some great causes. So if you get an opportunity to check out some of those observ um, organizations today, please do. What I'm gonna talk about today is not an overarching view on principles which are important for loading. I'm going to highlight a few principles which I find valuable in programming and just go over my interpretation of these principles and, and how I implement them in practice. And I'm specifically going to talk about when the goal is maximal adaptation. So I'm not really talking about uh, muscle healing or uh, loading inside that acute inflammatory phase. I'm going to talk about maximal adaptation um, or when loading healthy tissues if we believe that uh, other muscles could potentially be a contributing factor to the injury. So Natalia did a really nice job of highlighting how injury might emerge as a, an emergent process. And there's many determinants that, that may underpin it. And that's the way I'd look at uh, many of the physical qualities that are important for sports performance as well. So if we look at power output, rate of force development, reactivity, they're going to be underpinned by more basic determinants. And in this case, something like muscle cross-sectional area. So there needs to be a baseline level of cross-sectional area to have force potential. So any of these uh, more higher order physical qualities can emerge. And if we see someone and their isometric force is down by maybe 20, 30 percent, then our goal will be targeting cross-sectional area and muscle strength at this stage. And it's really about restoring the force potential before too much consideration into specific architectural adaptations. So we want to remove this as a limiting factor as quickly as possible so we can move on to some of the more fun stuff later on in the, in the rehab process. So it's really emphasizing that basic contractile machinery. And the process which describes how this hypertrophy occurs is mechanotransduction. And that describes how cells convert a mechanical stimulus to a biological response. In our case, those cells are the muscle fibers. So in the case of something like a bicep curl, the dumbbell is going to be the mechanical stimulus. We contract our muscles, the muscle fibers develop force, and there's these mechanosensors in the muscle then that uh, sense this force and a molecular response will occur. And hopefully that leads to hypertrophy. And the whole cascade, it can be determined by many factors like nutrition, sleep, etc. But what I'm going to be uh, speaking about particularly is the mechanical side of the equation, that initial, um, th that initial mechanical force which will set off that cascade. Because sometimes it doesn't uh, get set off and the hypertrophy and the strength does not occur. And I'll give a brief overview of some of the major variables which have been shown to be most important for the hypertrophy process, just so we have an idea of then how we can lever re leverage the mechanical variables toward them. So there's going to be a lot more nuance and context, but if I just highlight some of the, the major variables. And without going too much into these individual studies, if we zoom in on the muscle and what variables are important for the initial cascade, it's looking at what's the initial stimulus and, and what does the muscle notice? And it seems like the main variable in setting off the initial cascade is how much muscle, the, uh, how much tension the muscle generates and the duration of this tension. So in terms of things like contraction modes, speed of contraction, they don't seem to matter too much. It's more about just how much does that cell, that muscle fiber notice the tension and uh, the duration or volume of that. And if we zoom back out from that and look at um, maybe the systematic reviews that people like uh, Stuart Phillips, Brad Seanfield, they've done some, some great work in looking at uh, the hypertrophy studies in humans, what's the hypertrophy changes after six to eight weeks of training. And they find that the two most important variables are the intensity of effort and the volume. And if we break down that intensity of the effort a bit more, we're talking about volitional fatigue. So achieving absolute fatigue on the on the muscle that we're targeting and then internal focus it's that kind of inter, internal cue and the concentration and intent uh, to get that and it seems that the fatigue is independent of rep number so whether you go high reps or low reps it's not too important the most important thing is that we achieve fatigue in the muscle so if we join those two together we have uh, 
bit of a conceptualization here of how the concepts of fatigue and mechanical tension interrelate. So in the first one here, we've got um, like five reps into a 10 rep max set. And then we've got seven or eight reps into a 10 RM. And then we've got volitional failure. So in the black fibers here, here's the, the fibers that have fatigued and have received enough mechanical tension. Because it follows basically the size principle, 50% uh, into the set, those muscle fibers aren't recruited, recruited, they're not required to produce mechanical tension and they're not going to fatigue. So as the muscles generate tension, they eventually run out of energy and larger motor units and more muscle fibers will be required and then they experience tension. But it seems quite simple like that, but it actually can be a little bit tricky in practice because sometimes the way the exercise is set up prevents that from happening in the target muscle because other muscles fatigue first. And a phenomenon that illustrates it quite well is the motor redundancy problem, which was initially coined by Bernstein and uh, Mark Latash. He'll discuss it now in terms of the bliss of motor abundance. And it basically describes how we've got um, in, in many cases, we've got multiple degrees of freedom across joints and we've got many more muscles um, acting on those joints. So there's an infinite number of variables that the central nervous system needs to, to choose in, in um, achieving a certain task or in our case, performing an exercise. And it can be quite useful for uh, locomotion because we've got multiple muscles acting on a joint. There's a lot of redundancy. We can distribute stresses um, across the system. But in our case, it becomes a problem of motor abundance because we want to narrow the solutions. So their coordination strategy becomes um, the, fo the forces being funneled to the target muscle. So what we can do in that case is add constraints to the exercise. So we narrow the options available and hopefully funnel the effort to the target muscle. So I'll talk about some of the mechanical factors then um, that can act as constraints and how we can maybe manipulate the, those mechanical variables to increase the probability. The external moment arm, that's the distance from the ground reaction force to the joint. And a larger external moment arm will increase the torque required. So this tells us the requirement for, for higher muscle forces there. And for this guy on the left, we could see that the high external moment arm means there's a high requirement for quad forces here. And the guy on the right here, so he could um, try to have a high internal focus on trying to use his quads as much as possible. He could perform reps to failure and get fatigue in the exercise, but he still won't achieve enough retention in the quads. And that cascade won't get set off. So the first thing we need to do is set up or constrain the exercise in a way where the external moment arm is long on the joint we're targeting. And this sets the requirement for tension. Then there's the internal moment arm. And the internal moment arm, if we can see on the right here, it's the distance between the muscle's line of force and the joint axis of rotation. If the muscle has a longer moment arm, it will convert a given force to more torque. So it has an advantage over the other muscles with smaller moment arms. And in this case, when the hip is in neutral, the glute max has an advantage over the muscles. So there will be a requirement for the muscle to generate greater tension as it's the main generator of joint torque. So these are the two mecha main mechanical factors which influence the contribution, uh, but they don't really influence the force. They're, the muscle force, they're more determined by intrinsic factors like force length and tendon slack, but they don't seem to matter too much for hypertrophy and potentially strength. So transitioning into how I look at that in practice, I'm considering these kind of constraints in how we can consider these variables to reduce the contribution from other joints, then reduce contribution from other muscles and increase magnitude and duration of tension. So if we look at this example of a split squat, um, if we're trying to tag a muscle like adductor magnus, you can see that the load is shared fairly evenly across the ankle, knee and hip. And then if we look on the right here, we can see that the internal moments actually vary throughout um, range of motion. So the adductor magnus moment arm is only really high in that deep flexion period. So if we went to a five rep max with this guy, 
are we likely to accumulate sufficient magnus tension uh, so it can accumulate fatigue potentially not so what we can do is in this example on the left we can increase the hip extension moment arm and at the same time reduce the knee and ankle by lengthening the stance and then we can also flex the trunk slightly so we increase the relative hip flexion and then we can also sorry we can perform pause reps or some of you might see 1.5 reps where you do half a rep at the bottom of the exercise just so we can increase the time under tension on the muscle uh, in this position And you can see here a bit of a visualization about how that moment arm actually changes. Similarly, if we're trying to target a muscle like semitendinosus in a leg curl, you can see on the right here that the semitendinosus moment arm increases into knee flexion, whereas the membranosus is a little bit more even. And uh, the semimembranosus has a, has a big physiological cross-sectional area, so it has the potential to produce an awful lot of force in extension. So what can happen is athletes can create a lot of momentum in this extended position and then that momentum means there's not really a requirement for high muscle tension when you get into this more flex position. So potentially the, the tension on the semitendinosus is, is quite low. So what we can look at then is do some slower reps and focus the tension on where that contribution from the tendin tendinosus is going to be largest where that moment arm is largest. And then hopefully we, if we increase the time under tension on the semitendinosus, we're more, more likely to achieve that mechanical transduction. In a similar way, this is biceps from horse long head. Now I wouldn't be hugely confident on the moment arm here because it was only one paper. Usually you can cross correlate uh, different moment arms from different, different papers because there are sometimes a slight variance um, from different cadavers, different age groups, etc. Um, so this was only I could only find the biceps femoris long head moment arm on the hip uh, from one paper. But if we take an example like a single leg back extension on a glute ham raise, at this top position here, the moment arm is, is shortest in about neutral, and the contribution from glute max and, our, and the lumbar erectors are going to be high. So if we set the exercise up at, so the athlete can achieve plenty of hip flexion and emphasize the tension in this portion of the rep, then we're potentially going to get more tension on that biceps fem. And the cue I'd kind of use here as well, so we, we can set up the environment uh, mechanically first and constrain them that way. But then we can constrain them further by just using cues. So I would say curl with your heel and let the movement happen as a consequence of that. And I think uh, I like a quote here from a guy called Christian Thibodeau is that when you're lifting to build muscle mass, you don't lift weights, you can track muscles against the resistance. So it's not about creating loads of joint torque and trying to get as much weight up as possible. We're trying to funnel as much tension to, to the target muscle as possible. And that's how I'll communicate with the athlete. So I would say squeeze the muscle and let the movement happen as a consequence of that. And it becomes a constant dialogue throughout the session then because everyone's got a slightly different anatomy. Their moment arms are going to be a bit different. But if we can work through it together and encourage the athlete to be part of the problem solving process to, to achieve that tension or burn in the, the muscle we're looking for. And that's um, in some of those more proximal muscles where there's a lot of synergistic competition, that's particularly important to consider the internal moment arm as well. But for some muscles, like maybe the vasti or the soleus, there's not too much competition. So the main things to consider really are the external moment arm and, and the time under tension. So in the example of the, the soleus, if you look at the graph here on the right, this is the Achilles moment arm with the, the soleus would be the main contributor to that it's uh, dominant throughout the full range of motion. There's not really any competition from other muscles. Um, so we just need to really consider reducing contribution from other joints. And the main thing then is, is really considering logistics. So what equipment can you get? So the soleus can uh, be the predominant muscle that we're targeting. How can we achieve certain uh, enough load to achieve full mechanical tension and fatigue on the muscle? 
So we can just look at the logistics. If you've got a leg extension or a snip machine, that's great. Um, Colin Griffin showed a nice presentation, uh, a nice example last week from his calf presentation on how to load the, the slice with a landmine, if, if that's what you're restricted to. And it's just, if, if we know these conditions are important, uh, it was a, a nice quote from uh, Nicola von Dyke earlier on, keep the main thing the main thing. So be wary of introducing too much variation that reduces the, the load and the external moment arm on, on the slice. And again, the, the rep ranges don't seem to matter too much. So if you had asked me a year or two ago, I'd say Soleus is a slow twitch muscle. We need to go really high reps to, uh, to achieve um, a hypertrophy response there. But there's a recent paper come, uh, came out yesterday, actually. And they looked at uh, high reps versus low reps. So like 8 to 12 reps versus 20 to, uh, to 30 reps. And there was the same hypertrophy responses and strength responses after an intervention. So the main thing is just work to fatigue, but make sure other muscles don't fatigue first. And I'll often see exercises um, where we target maybe the slice or a calf in a, in a more functional movement, like a, a lunge. So in this case, you might do a lunge and then plantar flex onto the forefoot. And I think there, if there's some other goals like balance and coordination, that's absolutely great. But if we're trying to achieve localized tension to achieve the mechanic transduction in the muscle, it's probably not great. And there's going to be a trade-off there between the intramuscular coordination challenges and then the localized tension that we can get in the muscle. So I think what I would just say, uh, I'd be mindful of a large proportion of loading, not meeting, meeting the conditions that we, we spoke about previously. Because if the, if the rate limiter is hypertrophy, cross-sectional area and basic force output of the muscle, then um, all other co uh, qualities will be compromised as a result of this. So really just ag aggressively go after the rate limiter and then move on to um, some of the more uh, late stage goals. And just an example here, um, this is a setup where we looked at a standing plant flexion on a force platform and we looked at the inverse dynamics so we could get the joint contributions. And even in a movement like this where the the calf is going to be the dominant muscle group you would you would think in some cases the contribution of the ankle torque to the movement was sometimes as low as 40 percent and it just goes to show how effective the body is at distributing stress if it's given any opportunity at all so what we do now is we bring the foot forward so the ankle moment arm is as long as possible and the lateral malleolus is lined up with the, the point of contact there so we can minimize that knee moment arm as much as possible and an easy way to do that, I think, is in if you've got a decent leg press, you can see here there's no ex uh, knee extension moment arm whatsoever, and all of that stress will be distributed towards the calf. So in, a, in a, an exercise like that, the athlete's probably going to cheat, um, feel it in their calf. But if we had 15 people do standing isometrics for eight weeks, and some of them don't adapt too well, it may have been that the muscle didn't notice enough and we just need to further constrain the exercise so we can really accumulate the stress in that target muscle. So in summary, the body is very good at distributing forces across multiple joints and muscles. And that's well described from the, the problem of redundancy that we spoke about earlier on. And we need to constrain the options available to the nervous system. So we increase the probability and the likelihood that the for forces in the exercise are localized to the target muscle and manipulating external and internal moment arms can, can, form, can form an important part of this process.